there is some work done by Yale and George Mason University called the Six Americas. It really breaks down sort of the approaches that Americans have toward climate change from alarmed, concerned, cautious, disengaged, doubtful, and dismissive. So Catherine, how do you fine tune your message to those different types of people? We're actually working on exactly that right now with some people who are experts in social, social psychology, uh, media, and marketing. Because again, see, it's, it's going off of the science. It's into us. We're people. How do we react to facts? How do we react to information? We all have different values. We all have different things that motivate us. And so we have to recognize that for one person, um, making a better wor world for their child might be paramount. For another person, national security might be the issue that moves us. For someone else, else, a sense of responsibility, loving our neighbor, or um, stewarding creation might be what, what moves us to the next step. So even though there's a one-size-facts-fit-all, there's not a one-size-message-fits-all. And that's a new thing within the scientific community. You are not trained to be communicators. You're trained to be researchers. Mm -hmm. Communication is not what you're paid for. It's not what gets you no. tenure. It's not what gets you professional accolades, et cetera. Uh, this is a, something on top of what you're all trained and expected to do. Mm -hmm. So how are you doing at that? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're doing it because, like I said, we have a responsibility, I feel like. We, we, we have this issue, I think I probably speak for all of us here, that if we hold silent on it, who will speak? We are not in this because we value people's opinions of us. We are not in this because we want to receive pleasant emails in the morning. We're in it because this is the truth, and we have to tell it. Um, then you've also been a key person speaking to communities of faith, and that's one of the most powerful levers, a lot of people in faith. So how do you get over that God sovereignty issue that humans can't affect creation? <laughs> that is actually a fairly common question, but it's easy to answer. Just look around us today. Do we see things happening that are bad? Do we see consequences of poor choices that we've made all the time? Somebody has a drink too many, gets in the car, kills an innocent person. We make poor health choices. It leads to health issues later in life. We see all the time evidence of reaping what we have sowed. And there's even verses in the Bible that tell us that. So there's no way challenges God's sovereignty. Rather, it's a reflection of the free will that he's given us to make choices and then to bear the consequences of those choices. Michael Mann, anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think that um, at some level, um, you know, whether you want to frame this in terms of religious faith, uh, faith or, um, or ethics, um, to me, we focus so much on climate change as an issue of science or an issue of policy or economics, you know, cost-benefit analysis, but, uh, you know, not often enough do we frame it for the issue that it really is, ultimately. It's an issue of our ethical obligation. Um, uh, I have a daughter, you know, who's seven years old, um, and I want to make sure that we don't make decisions today, that we don't lock, um, you know, that we, we, that we don't lock in a, a future, um, a, a degraded earth for her children and grandchildren through the decisions we are making now with our fossil fuel emissions. Um, we, you know, to some extent, we have, um, you know, we have gained uh, economically from uh, access to cheap, you know, dirty, uh, sources of energy, uh, but there's a very real cost of that, and that cost is going to be borne increasingly down the road. Um, we still have time to avert a, a, a future where we leave our children and grandchildren a degraded planet, but there isn't a whole lot of time to do that.